The Fitness Gram Pacer Test is a multi-stage aerobic capacity test that progressively gets more difficult as it continues. Continues. Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perotti. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hi, everybody. I am Dr. David Perotin, host of the Safety Doc Podcast, film live down here in the North Star Recording Studio, and it is a brisk. 51 degrees right now in the North Star Recording Studio. Believe it or not, folks, it's actually dropped a degree since I came down here a while ago. But it is the better option of the two because outside right now it is minus four, which might be our high for the day. So, yeah, it's chilly right here. But you know what? Um, we're going to heat things up today by having guest Drew Bay on and also talking about fitness. Um you know, we talk so much on the Safety Doc po podcast about uh, well-being, about physical safety, but we don't talk about how fitness intersects with safety. There's that connection there, and especially with kids, and there's a, a lot of things happening right now in schools that we need to address. For example, schools deciding not to have kids participate in physical fitness, um, the reasons for that, the ramifications for that. So let me tell you about Drew. So Drew Bay has been teaching and writing about exercise for over 20 years, during which time he has personally instructed hundreds of clients one-on-one -on -one through tens of thousands of workouts. He maintains the number one blog on high-intensity strength training. Check it out, bay.com, B-A-Y-E.com. And has been featured in several books about exercise, including The New Bodybuilding for Old School Results by Ellington Darden, Ph.D., Heart Strong by Ken Hutchins, and The 4-Hour Body by Tim Ferriss. And he is also a dungeon master, Dungeons & Dragons. He's there. So, um, Drew, thanks so much for being a guest on the Safety Doc Oh, Podcast. thanks for having me on. Glad to be here. Looking forward to it. So, let's get started. How can people contact you? And, and if you can share some of the work um, that, that you do, because, yeah, I, I want to make sure that we, we address that. You know, right up, right up Trump, because I think a lot of people are very interested. The easiest way for people to get a hold of me is by email. It's just drew at bay.com, and they can find that just by going to my website. It's bay.com, B-A-Y-E. So if they got questions, they're welcome to email, uh, comment uh, with their questions and blog posts. And I can be found on Twitter, Facebook, pretty much everything else by just searching for Drew Bay. Okay. And Drew, um, you know, I, I've seen a number of your social media posts. And so people who are uh, want to learn more, they're serious about fitness. Um, tell me what you can, what you can do for those, those folks. Um, I offer one-on-one -on -one consultations and online training. Uh, and how that typically works is we'll set up a phone call or a Skype call. I'll have them complete a detailed health history and exercise and diet history questionnaire, all that stuff. And then we'll talk about what they want to accomplish and help them put together an exercise and nutrition plan for that, go over all their questions that's it in a nutshell. Obviously, there's a lot more to the process, to the system than that, but basically what I do, help people okay. troubleshoot their uh, exercise and diet programs. And something that uh, that stood out to me is, you know, you'll share and say, hey, today I was helping somebody who's, you know, 75 years old or somebody who had, you know, some kind of, you know, medical event or, or some type of disability where we kind of think maybe physical fitness training doesn't apply and you're like, absolutely, it does. I mean, it applies at, at any age. And um, I, th I think that's another part because sometimes when, or at least when I, when I initially thought about, you know, fitness and training, I'm thinking about, you know, 
people maybe in their 20s and 30s who are doing this to train for marathons and triathlons and it's there's so much more than that there's there's really no there's no age limit there's there's it, it no age limit there is the only limit that there is is and it's actually it's an extremely extremely low limit is whether they can voluntarily contract their muscles Okay. Anybody that can voluntarily contract their muscles is capable of exercising effectively and safely. It's just depending on your physical condition and capabilities, you might need to make some modifications to make it safe and practical. You can take somebody who's bedridden, uh, severe sarcopenia and osteoporosis in very, very weak, very deconditioned, and still have them exercise. It's just you would not train them the same way that right. you would a college or a professional athlete. Same principles, but the application is going to be very different depending on the person, but they can still exercise. So, Drew, um, let's, talk about, let's talk about students, you know, elementary students, you know, middle school, high school. Um, how would you define what a physically fit student should look like you know maybe a physically fit 12 year old what what is a physically fit 12 year old what's the, that profile man and yeah, this might piss some people off but uh kids should not be fat first and foremost uh in fact most kids if they are active enough and if they are being fed properly healthy food in appropriate amounts should be relatively lean um, they should have visible, not ripped like bodybuilders, but they should have visible definition in their muscles. Um, look at some of the films from physical education in right. the 1960s. And, you know, the guys were going through a lot of the drills shirtless just in gym shorts, and you can see almost every single kid had visible separation in their abdominal muscles and the muscles of the back and arms. Uh, and you barely ever see that now. It's, it's a shame because there's no reason that it shouldn't still be that way. But that's, that's what kids should look like. Kids now should still look like kids did back in the 1950s and 1960s. Okay. You know, I, I remember when I was in uh, high school and – I was uh, 162 pounds and, you know, really active and, and, you know, playing different sports. But, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, remember my classmates, I mean, we were all kind of in that range. I go back and going through some yearbook photos and, um, but you're, you so, so we talked about, you know, the, the profile of a physically fit student. Um, so, I, here's the argument that comes up on the on social media right now when they you know they're they're talking about physically fit students. Um, why are kids not as physically fit today? Is it, is it that big of an issue? And and some people write, well, maybe it, it, how much of it is diet related? I guess that's my question because someone Most will say, so. when I was growing up, I would eat. It seemed like I could eat anything, you know, like um, hot dogs, Doritos, and things like that. But I was active. So it didn't show on my body, but how much of that is really true versus maybe we actually were eating much better, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Well, it's both the type of food and the quantity. Um, and they've done studies on this, and I can't cite them off the top of my head, but they looked at activity levels versus calorie consumption and found that the amount of food has been a much larger factor than activity. Although, and this is something that a lot of people don't consider, they assume that if you're more active, you're going to be burning more calories. Although most people overestimate the amount of calories burned during activity. And also there's studies showing that the energy expenditure doesn't increase proportionally to the activity. If you increase activity beyond some number of hours per week, instead of the expenditure continuing to rise, it levels off. The big thing is kids are eating a lot more and they're eating more calorie-dense foods. But with activity, you know, the thing that a lot of people don't appreciate is although you don't burn that many additional calories 
getting out and moving around. When you are engaged in physical activities, uh, playing sports and physical games, uh, or out just riding your bike with your friends, doing you know kind of stuff that kids did more of when we were younger, it's harder to be shoving food in your face than when you're sitting in front of your laptop or your video right. game console. People are preoccupied with the physical activity, so they are not as likely to be snacking while they're doing it. Now, it does have an impact. It's just that the diet is really the bigger part of it. But there are other benefits to being up and moving around. Even though the effect on body composition is not huge, there are benefits to your joints. There are benefits to the circulatory system. There are benefits, uh, psychological benefits, mood benefits that come from out and moving around. Right. And that doesn't even get into the social benefits of regularly engaging in face-to-face -face activities with your peers as opposed to, you know, the kids just sitting there staring at their uh, devices, chatting back and forth. So right. I think we're missing a lot by not having kids out moving around, doing stuff with their friends rather than <laughs> sitting in front of their Xboxes or Playstations. There's you know, no harm in that a little bit, but they can't be doing it all the time. Same thing in school with the physical uh, education. It's probably not the most important thing that they could be doing during the day. That's something that they should be getting at home and on weekends. But since they're not, we ought to be including it. Plus, and I haven't read a lot of the research on this, but if I recall correctly, there are benefits to concentration and learning from being able to get up and right. move around during the day instead of being seated the entire time. Which is, you know, even if you take an hour away to do some sort of physical activity, if it benefits concentration and learning during the rest of the day, it's worth that investment. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. Jello Beats, holla at me. <laughs> But there was something you said earlier that I want to touch on, and that's you know this whole aspect of setting goals. So you you talked about a physical education class, and I remember FIED, you know, but I don't remember FIED where we ever sat down and and set goals or tried to understand the metrics of you know what is what's our heart rate, what is whatever. It was just let's go out and play. You know, <laughs> we're gonna play football today. Um, or, you know, badminton, and we learned the sport, but we never learned fitness. So I guess help me to understand, you know, for parents listening to this, maybe educators, um, what are some ways to bring in goals that kids can actually understand or how they can track? Because if we do that, you know, it, it is, it's definite, right? Anything we write down, I think we're 40% more likely to do. Um, and then we also just become more committed and invested to things once we once we start putting it into into writing. But yeah, it's completely I think missing. How 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 would you recommend well, that? Yeah, now now that you mention it, I can remember all the physical fitness tests that we did when we were in if I had, when we were in grade school and we we're in high school, and uh, always looked forward to that because it was kind of a, a time to show off for some of us. But again, back then, if you were out of shape, if you were a little bit heavy, it was unusual, not the norm. Now it's kind of the other way around. 
But for all the testing they did, there was never any discussion of how some people might improve upon where they were. It's just, where are you? Okay, here's, here's where you fall. I don't recall any of my physical education teachers ever sitting down and talking to us and saying, okay, this is what your score is, and this is what it ought to be, or for some of us, this is what you can do to improve it even further. Right. Most of it was about learning various games and sports, and while there may be some social benefit to that, there's definitely some psychological benefit to that, I think that uh, they're missing out by not talking about what fitness is and how to most effectively improve it. Um, I don't remember ever hearing anything about nutrition in you know, physical education classes. Uh, maybe I just don't remember it, but I, I can't think of a single instance where they talked to, to us about that. And unfortunately... That's it's probably one of the most important things that they could be teaching kids, because I know a lot of parents aren't. A lot of people don't even, in fact, if you were to ask a whole lot of people, they wouldn't be able to even give you a very good definition of fitness or of exercise. Oh, right. That's right. Ask 100 people to define fitness, and you'll get some very vague uh, talk about your ability to do activities without fatigue or whatever. Or if you ask them what exercise is, most people can't define exercise. Or if they do, they do it in such a vague way that it's almost meaningless. Right. Fitness, in a nutshell, is your ability to perform various physical tasks without fatigue and without injury. And it comes down to your functional ability, which I'm going to try to give you the short version because I've actually done like two-hour talks on what function oh, yeah. is. But there are... Factor, functional ability, your ability to perform a physical task, relies on factors that are genetic. They're not trainable, so we're not concerned with them with exercise. Things like your musculoskeletal geometry. People that have different bodily proportions will be better at some activities, not so much at others. Look at wrestlers. Look at volleyball and basketball players. Different body types may be able to perform some activities better. So your Musculoskeletal geometry influences your functional ability in different activities. Neurological efficiency. Some people are more coordinated than others. Not really trainable. But then we have the trainable factors of functional ability. Some of them are general. If you improve them, they apply to everything else that you do. These are your muscular strength and local muscular endurance, your cardiovascular and metabolic efficiency, your flexibility, your bone and connective tissue strength, because no matter how strong your muscles are, they can't exert force on the rest of the world without transmitting that force through your joints sure. and through your bones. If you get weak bones and the connective tissue, you're going to get hurt doing stuff. And body composition. And the body composition is probably a big one with most students. When most people think body composition, they're thinking about looking good on the beach. How much muscle do you have versus how much fat? But the reason it's considered a factor of functional ability or fitness and not just about looking good is the more body fat you have, the more mass your muscles have to move either to move yourself around or right. in attempting to, if you're going to pick something up, you're not just moving the object, you're also moving the body segments that are involved in picking it up. And if a person gets fat enough, their fat can actually start to interfere with their, their flexibility. Oh, Beyond sure, some sure. point, it gets in. For example, the sit and reach test. People think of the sit and reach where you're sitting on the floor, your feet are against a box, and you're trying to reach forward. It's as much a test of body composition as it is of flexibility. Because regardless of how flexible your hamstrings and lower back are, if you've got a big fat belly, it's going to get in your way. Right. And what, what people also don't realize is it's also a test of a non-trainable factor, which is bodily dimensions. I have very short legs and very long arms for my height. And because of that, with my feet against the box and reaching, 
I went further than these little girls who were gymnastic who were gymnasts who could practically fold their bodies in half right. just because of the chimpanzee like proportions. So, but the body fat gets in the way of moving. The fatter you are and the less muscle you have, which is really the problem a lot of people have, they're not just over fat, they're under muscled, the less capable you are of moving your own body. The more fat and the less muscle, the harder it is for you to run, to climb, to jump, to fit in places if you need to get through something to be able right. to either get out of a dangerous situation or get to safety. So these are the factors of functional ability. The best way, the safest way to improve all of them is with strength training. Most people think of strength training as a way to just increase muscular strength and size. But your heart doesn't know the difference between different physical activities. The only thing it knows is metabolic demand. If you jog, if you cycle, if you swim, the reason your heart rate goes up is because it's working harder to support the work the muscles are doing. Right. Sure. If you strength train with a high intensity of effort, and it doesn't mean using very heavy weight, just continuing an exercise until you can barely move the weight that you're using, and that could be barbell, machine, or your body weight. If you do this, using exercises that involve the bigger muscle groups, you actually have the same type of stress on the heart that you get from jogging or cycling or swimming or doing these other activities, but you get it at the same time that you're stimulating these other benefits. Okay. Flexibility improves by just moving through a full range of motion on a regular basis. And you strength training will do this, uh, but you can get it doing a lot of other activities. Bone and connective tissue strength increase with muscular strength. And body composition is mostly a matter of diet, but the more muscle mass you have, the higher your metabolic rate, the easier it is for you to lose fat. So strength training, if it's performed properly, addresses all of these things and should be the focus of a physical education program. How to strength train to maximize the benefits to all these different factors of functional ability. Now, when it comes to exercise I, I said earlier, a lot of people can't define exercise, or if they do so, it's very, very vague. And I would define exercise as a process whereby the body performs work of a demanding nature in accordance with muscle and joint function for the purpose of creating tension and fatigue in the targeted muscles to stimulate improvements in muscular strength and size and through the stress on the muscles, to place a demand on and stimulate improvements in all of those other supporting systems. Basically, strength training performed in a way that benefits all of the general trainable factors of functional ability. Right. Everything else is still beneficial, but unless it does all of these things and unless it does them safely, they're not exercise because consider the idea is to stimulate the body to improve. We want to maximize your functional ability, which indirectly benefits long-term health without undermining your long-term health in the process. If you, you can exercise in a way that's very safe, or you can exercise in a way that's still very effective but beats up your joints and spine, right. but if you do that, eventually you're not going to be able to continue exercising because of the injuries incurred, and as soon as you're not able to, you're going to start on the decline. When your muscle mass and your bone mass start to go, everything else follows. Wow. So that should be that should be the focus. It and should be. And testing should be used to determine, you know, where the kids are starting out and what is a realistic degree of improvement to encourage as well as there, there needs to be some kind of dietary counseling. Now unfortunately it comes down to the parents because the kids are eating what their parents are. Well, also the schools, though. Um, I, I've i seen some of the school lunch menus. Pizza, right. fried chicken. You got it. Um, just, they're, they're not giving these kids steak and vegetables or grilled chicken breasts and things like that. Um, but the parents need to be educated on this. And unfortunately, a lot of them aren't. Actually, they're worse. They're not just not educated. 
they have been badly misinformed by the massive amount of advertising telling them things like cereal is good for them for breakfast. Right. Uh, so there needs to be education on how to safely and effectively strength train and how to do it in a way that is sustainable because a lot of what's promoted is just absurd in terms of the recommended weekly volume and frequency. A lot of people won't adhere to that. Most people don't realize that if they do this stuff correctly, about 20 to 30 minutes, two or three times a week is as much as anybody needs. That's and yeah. if they just want to get you know, a good level of physical conditioning and health with the minimal investment possible, once a week is effective. It might not be optimal, but it's highly effective if done right. And But they also they need to be talked to about nutrition. And their parents need to be talked to about nutrition. If you go home, you could know as a student everything you need to about what you should be eating and how much. But if your mom is going to the grocery store and she's bringing home you know, mac and cheese and pizza and... You know, she's giving you cereal for breakfast, and all there is to drink in the house is, well, there's water, of course, but is juice and sugary drinks. You're kind of stuck with it as a kid. So, like, starting out the morning with oatmeal. I mean, it's, it, I mean like, oatmeal, um, you know, not from a, uh, you know, little rip container that you pour in and add water, but, like, you know, oatmeal where you got to boil the water, you know, let the oats go in and... It's, it's that, not the absolute worst thing that you could eat for breakfast. <laughs> okay. If you look at food in terms of nutrients relative to energy, uh, we need to have a certain amount of protein per day. And if people exercise, and by exercise I specifically mean strength train. Everybody should strength train. In fact, nobody would even think of stopping brushing and flossing. Everybody brushes and flosses because they know they have to. If they don't, their teeth are going to decay, they're going to look bad, they're not going to work right, and they're going to have other health problems. Exercise is exactly the same. We should think of exercise the same way we do brushing our teeth. It's just something that you do to maintain your overall health and fitness. So everybody... there. Every single person should strength train. In the same way that everybody should be brushing their teeth, everybody should be strength training in a way that is safe for them. Obviously, it does vary between individuals. But because of this, we need more protein, so that's a consideration. Um, for people who strength train, which should be everybody, should be getting twice the RDA of protein. So you want to make sure that you're eating foods that give you a, or at least meals that give you a relatively high protein to energy ratio. You also want to get adequate micronutrients. And the best way to do this is with a variety of good quality meats and plant foods. I know we get some, we've got some, uh, I'll say cultists, because that's really what it is, that are in the extremes of veganism, or now you've got the carnivore diet. They're all nuts. And I know a lot of them are going to get upset with me saying, you're all completely nuts. We are omnivores. We do best with both. Now, some individuals will do better with more or less of either. But there is no single, this is the way every single human has to eat. Principles, same for everybody. Best application of the principles is going to vary between individuals. But in general, you want to have a good, you know, get enough protein, but also have enough micronutrients. Meat, fish, eggs, lots of leafy vegetables, and moderate amounts of fruits and nuts, things that are more calorie dense. And that's another reason to opt for these. You want to eat foods that are going to be very satiating, either because of the effect on hormones, protein. You eat higher protein foods, you're not going to be as hungry. You're less likely to overeat. Foods that have a lot more fiber, a lot of plant matter, not the starchier stuff. You want to be careful with that. But if you eat a lot of protein and a lot of fiber, you're less likely to overeat. Most of the foods that are packaged things, most of the snack foods are designed to be easy to overconsume because if you eat them and you're still hungry, you're going to buy more. Combinations of fat and carbohydrate and salt 
devoid of most other nutrients, just, I mean, sit down and try to finish a 12-ounce steak. You're going to be stuffed by the time you're done with it. But if you had, I'm trying to think of a, a, a crappy, you know, something like uh, a bowl of, uh, uh, what is it, or I can't remember, fruity pebbles or something like okay, that. Okay, sure, sure. A person could sit down and finish bowls and bowls and bowls and consume far more calories worth of that and barely be full. Right. Or rice, it is very easy to consume a large amount of rice and consume a massive amount of calories, but rice and grains, and I know some people say, oh, grains are poison, legumes are poison, all this stuff, is, it's not poison. And they'll say, oh, well, the you know, phytotoxins and anti-nutrients and all that, well, it's not going to kill you if you're not eating a massive amount. You can have right. oatmeal for breakfast, but you wouldn't, you'd want it to be the side, like little bit of oatmeal maybe with some berries or some fruit cut up in it. But the majority of the breakfast and the majority of most meals should be meat and vegetables. You don't okay. see a lot of people eating this way, though. If people ate that way, right. again, yeah. meat, fish, eggs, vegetables, moderate amount of fruits and nuts, and be very strict with it, very strictly limit things that have a lot of calories that are easy to consume that don't make you full, but have very little protein or nutrients. Anything with a lot of sugar, anything with a lot of refined grains. And you want to avoid things that are pro-inflammatory. You don't want to have a lot of heavily processed seed and vegetable oils. But what is everything made of? You know, sugar, refined grains, you know, seed and vegetable oils. Right. In fact, it's hard to avoid. If you go through any grocery store and you walk down some of the aisles and just pick random boxes of things and read it, there's corn syrup and there's you know soy in almost everything flour it's sugar it's just mostly garbage the kids have again getting back on point though the kids have no control so they can be taught but ultimately to fix this the parents need to start taking responsibility for what they're putting on their kids plates and yeah that's real. That's not on the schools, and it's not. It's not the schools' fault. The, the schools and teachers are expected to do a whole lot that they really shouldn't be. That sure. really ought to be the parents' responsibility. So, but how do you do that? How does the gym teacher yeah. say, you know, little Johnny and little Susie, it's your parents' fault that you're fat, and I want you to tell them that I said that, and this is what they need to. Take this list, and this is what they buy next time they go to the grocery store. Tell them to clean out the pantry, throw out the fruit roll-ups and right. the sugary cereals. Tell them to toss, you know, all of the what it like pop tarts and all of this other stuff, yeah. and start giving you some steak and vegetables for your lunch. Now, of course, the parents are going to freak out, but that's. But I guarantee you too, if little Johnny and Susie come to school and they're Waist circumference is the same as their height. Their parents are probably at least as big. So they probably need to, to hear it. A must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, a brave demonstration of speaking truth to power. School of Errors rips the lid off the billion dollar school safety industry. Using real world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. So, Drew, to, to you know, take us into another area that, that builds uh, right off of what you're saying. Um, so, I've got it up on a uh, screen to the right of me. And, and first of all, you know, it was, it was back in the 1950s, uh, President Eisenhower uh, was horrified that the Europe, European school children were um, acing physical uh, fitness for competitive rock climbing. So he was seeing how physically fit um, the European children were 
put in place the presidential physical fitness program, which we had up until not too long ago. I remember uh, as a, a kid in the 70s and in 80s, you know, doing the shuttle run in the gym and some of these activities and then um, earning jump, the, yeah, ups, the wall squat, all that stuff. I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know why, but I did know if I hit a certain criteria, I got the uh, the blue badge with the presidential seal that you could sew on uh, your jacket. And, and that was, you know, I guess for an incentive, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, coming back to what you're saying, I I think in schools, um, you know, we, again, it's it, it, there's a massive push to introduce kids to a lot of different activities, but there isn't a push to say, why? Do, here's baseline. Here's an activity to move you from a baseline, and then you know, here's how to measure change from baseline. Um, it, you know, so that. And, and you're, you're right. That's part of a whole state curriculum that comes down and and and, and all of that. Um, but what's happening right now in California? So this is interesting. Um, I, I want to make sure I've got it accurate. It's uh, just came out on February seventh. Governor Newsom in California proposed in the 2020 and 21 budget um, to suspend uh, testing for three years for uh, physical activity and also encouraging. We're giving schools the option in California to basically suspend physical fitness, take it out of the schedule. So now, first of all, I'm thinking, okay, California, the weather's pretty nice, right? Like in Wisconsin, <laughs> I wouldn't have had any problem. I mean, we were going outside in, in, in winter, take a little break off from that. But um, but here's the reason, though. Th this is, it, and it gets to what you've been saying, right? The reason for this isn't something i guess that would be based in in some rational of say, rationale saying hey we've had kids um who've had heat stroke or something like this so we have to evaluate what we're doing and how much time king kids are outside that's not the reason here's the reason specifically noted um they're they're suspending this because they believe it can lead to body shaming and bullying and also that it would discriminate against children with disabilities and children who identify as non-binary. Now, I want to just jump in on one, one of these points. The children with disabilities, um, just excluding them from physical education. I wrote a paper a year ago for Cap and Journal, which actually got contacted on this morning by someone wanting to cite it. And it was where schools were exempting students with disabilities from safety instruction, which is against the law. It violates ADA. You cannot do that. So I and I'm still like that. That's the all the time people contact me in districts exactly. and I instruct and I say you can't do this, but they're basically saying the same thing, you know, kind of here they're saying well you can do this exemption. Now of course I look at this, you look at this, and I'm like the the issues. I was a special education director. I remember starting out we had a handful of type one diabetes students, a handful of type two. And I remember when I left as an administrator, we had a lot of students identifying as type two. And I think, you know, I would read, I'd have the medical reports um, that would come from the physicians. And a lot of it was saying um, the child, it, it's diet related. This is why this, you know, body mass, a child is presenting early stages of, of type two diabetes. So, you know, as everything you've talked about, joint health, cardiovascular health, um, it's not that all of a sudden when you get out of school, these things improve. You're setting this this course up, uh, this this pattern. And, you know, I've, I've seen documentaries of, of young kids being treated for fatty liver disease, things that, you know, physicians said I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd be, be seeing. So so we have now this, this whole um, range of exemptions and basically shutting shutting this down because, and, and this is where I'm going to catch heat, you know, because the the thought we're going to hurt people's feelings, and I'm thinking, well, you're you're going to hurt people's feelings if this, you know, this kid needs a re, a knee replacement at 18, or you know, something happens and they have a heart attack at you know age 20 because they've been doing some, I mean. It's so crazy now. We just of this this culture to make exemptions and just basically say this is okay. And I would say from a scientific standpoint, though, we want people to be as 
fit we, and, and to have as much knowledge in consuming the right foods as they can because it impacts, yeah, not only your, your physical fitness, but how you think, right? <laughs> how you sleep. I mean, all of these, these things. Um, so I, I want to get your take because, you know, this is, it's, you know, California now is basically is saying, hey, you know, as you do your schedules, you can take phi education, physical education out of your schedule, which also means we're taking out, you know, any part of teaching kids about healthy, um, you know, consumption of, of foods, how to plan out their diets, how to understand different things. I see this as a huge threat to safety because, uh, you know, what do we need for safety? We need to, to be able to um, respond with strength. There's a program called Teen Cert out there put on by FEMA where they, they come to schools and they teach kids to actually how to, like, crib a, a, a car if it's tipped over or a structure in a, in a hurricane, how to, like, you know, evacuate people off of a bus. And I'm thinking these kids would be winded by the time – you know, they got 50 feet away, they'd be stopping and being like, ah, okay, I just need a break. And, you know, any type of, any type of crisis situation, you're, you're going to handle it better if you're more physically fit. I mean, I don't think there's any argument against that, whether it be a car accident, whether it be falling on a playground, um, you, you know, if you had an injury, um, if you're physically fit, it would be less of an injury, you'd be able to recover from it sooner. But um, give me your perspective and, and your voice into this because I'm looking at this saying, this is actually happening. I can't believe that th this is this is where we're at. It's insane. Um, I don't want to go too much. I'll get right to the safety point because otherwise I could talk for hours on the other stuff. I'm just going to say they're absolutely out of their minds. Um, consider that in the long run, the way that other people perceive and interact with you, all of your social interactions and the effect on, and not just social interactions, but also your ability to advance professionally, right or wrong, is affected by your physical appearance. I would rather say something that somebody's going to be a little bit upset about when they're younger that puts them on the path to getting themselves in the best shape possible than spare their feelings when they're younger and have them have a life of misery because they figure they should be able to do whatever and not have anybody say anything that might bother them, knowing that still it's going to negatively affect all of the social interactions from then on out. It's, it's absolutely insane. Um, doctors are running into this too, though. So there are some doctors who are now afraid of telling their patients what they need to hear because they're worried that they're going to get complaints. Listen, so-and-so, you're fat. You need to change this and that and the other thing, or you're going to end up with all these problems. That's what you expect to hear from your doctor if you're fat, but they don't even want to tell people that because they get upset over it. Right. From a safety standpoint, there's a couple different things. Um, mobility. One, your own ability to move your body, but also how easy it is for other people to move your body. In a, you know, like a school shooting situation or in a lot of other disasters, a lot of people, they think run from danger, not the mindset. You want to run to safety rather than from danger. Just going away from the danger without knowing that where you are going to is safer is problematic. But to be able to move yourself away from the danger and towards safety is going to be so much easier if you are stronger and not fat because you will be able to, all else being equal, the stronger you are, the faster you are able to move. The less fat you are, the faster you are able to move. Also, if you are less fat, you, are more easy, you can more easily extricate yourself from a... Like if you're trapped in a car and you only have a cert, you can only get the door open so far, or if there's some other opening, a door can only open so far, or if there's a collapsed building and you only have a limited space that you can move through. If you're really fat, you're not going to be able to do that. So you need to be strong and you need to have a healthy body composition to be able to move yourself to safety. If you are stronger 
it will be easier for you to aid other people that need help right. getting to safety. And then something a lot of people don't to consider is the less fat you are, the easier it is for other people to pick you up and carry you or aid you in getting to safety if necessary. A few years ago, we were on vacation in South Florida, and we were in a parking lot, and across the parking lot there was a restaurant, and there was a very obese woman that slipped and fell. There were a bunch of women with her and a couple men, men, sorry, it's just, they couldn't pick her up off the ground. Wow. She was so fat. Um, after talking with her, assuring that, you know, there's no pain in her hips or legs, there's nothing broken, because you don't want to stand her up onto a broken hip or broken leg. I managed to get my arms underneath the back of her arms and sort of deadlift her uh, up to a position where she could, you know, that we could kind of lever her forward and stand. But she was stuck on the ground because she was so fat nobody could help her up. Right. I saw the same thing in the mall a few weeks ago. Some enormous, well, two things. One, the woman was enormous. And two, uh, I'm assuming the husband was a twig. The guy looked like a stiff wind would blow him over. Okay. And there's a rest area in the middle of this uh, mall on the bottom floor. They've got some couches and chairs um, in between some uh, kiosks where they're selling you know, want the sushi and some other things. So we were there getting some sushi, and, and I heard this yelling. And I looked over, and the woman was on the couch trying to rock forward, yelling at her husband to help her off the couch. And so he turned back and he went over and it was a struggle because she was big and because he was weak. Okay. You want to be strong and you want to be, a, you don't have to be ripped. Not everybody has to walk around with the six pack, but you want to be strong enough that you can move yourself quickly and that you can pick up and help other people when they need it. You want to be lean enough that you are able to move quickly. You're not carrying a bunch of extra weight. And that if somebody else has to help you, they don't, they don't have to be extremely strong to be able to do it. The, and also consider that the better shape you're in, the more helpful you are to others in danger and the less of a burden you are on the other helpers. Right. Everybody benefits from people being in better physical condition. There's, there's no downside to it. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. Jello Beats, holla at me. <laughs> Test. And that's test. part of, for example, the FEMA Teen Cert program. Um, they teach kids how to perform, you know, light search and rescue, um, how to help other survivors, um, you know, if, if that was the event. But um, something, you know, that also you know, students with with disabilities, and, and let's say it's a physical disability. I mean, I knew many kids. I know many adults with uh, physical disabilities who. Um, are very uh, interested and aware of, of fitness and wanting to be fit. And I worked with physical therapists for years. And part of what we did in schools and as and, and kids would work in physical therapy, but then in their all in overall fitness, is they could transfer easier, you know, whether it be from a, a wheelchair to a standing position or whether from a piece of furniture, um, you know, it, into a wheelchair, whatever it was. But, um, but, yeah, it, you're, you know, you're completely right. Um, 
that you can participate um, in your own safety, getting yourself to safety. You can help with somebody else. And I think another point, too, is you can do this faster because we're seeing, yes, if, we, if we just talk about intruder events, and there's so much more to safety than intruder events, but if we talk about intruder events, you know, these, these are 15 to 50 seconds. These are, are short events, um, typically used to be longer, but it, you know, it might be where you need to get yourself, um, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet away at a, at a very fast amount of time. Distance is your friend in a shooting situation. Yeah. The more distance you can the more distance you can put between yourself and the shooter and the more not just concealment but the more cover you can put between yourself and the shooter the better. The faster a kid can run, the more quickly they can get to their designated areas or behind cover. The stronger they are, the more quickly they can help somebody else get to the area or behind cover. Right. It's and with, with regards to the disabled, you know, if, if people have uh, physical disabilities, rather than excusing them, we should be accommodating them to try to maximize their fitness and body composition to compensate for the disabilities and make them as strong and fit as humanly yeah. possible. I agree, and they and they want that, right? This is, you know, so so there's this whole concept too of they they don't want to participate, they don't want to do this. And I'm like, yeah, they do, they they do. Your, you know, whoever positionality, whether it's a legislator or it's a, a you know, parent or principal or whatever, it's like that's that's not accurate. That's not what I found from my my years of working, you know, with people with with disabilities. That want um, to accommodate rather than exclude. It makes no sense to just say, well. You're disabled, so you can sit out. Because it only compounds the problem. People think, well, maybe if, I, if I'm not physically fit, if my kids aren't physically fit, it might affect them when they're 50 or 60. But it's like, no, I guess from your perspective, what's, what's the early onset of if, you know, a kid isn't physically fit, isn't eating well, is overweight, what can happen by the time they're 12, 15, 20 you know, well, what can start manifesting? Metabolic disorders and diabetes are a big one if they're younger and if they're eating, you know, a lot of garbage. Um, in terms of safety and injury prevention, there is, you know, the stronger your muscles are, the stronger your tendons and bones and connective tissue are going to be, unless there's some sort of weird genetic disorder, they will all get stronger together. You are less likely, if you have to do something that's physically demanding, you're less likely to pull you know, strain or tear a muscle, you're less likely, if your joints and bones are stronger, to have a sprain or, a, you know, tear a, a ligament or to have a broken bone. Bone density goes up with strength training, measurably. It's a, strength training is the best thing that uh, people can do for improving and maintaining a high level of bone density. So it literally, it makes you more resistant to injury. In fact, neck exercise specifically has been shown to significantly reduce the incidence of concussions. Um, okay. there, I can't remember the specific uh, football team. There was a college football team that after they started having their football players do loaded you know, neck, neck flexion extension, a couple other exercises, they cut the rate of concussions in half. So if your kid, well, you'd assume that, you know, if your kids are playing any kind of sports, you know, parents would realize, okay, well, they got to do some sort of physical conditioning with it. And they often assume that there's going to be some physical conditioning component to the practice. Not all schools do that. But it's not just for, again, little Johnny or Susie playing football or um, soccer. Just kids, you know, out running around doing things, skateboarding, cycling, if they are stronger, they take a fall, you know, stronger bones could be the difference between maybe a bad bruise and a trip to the ER to get a cast put on something. Right. Uh, it, it does make a significant difference. And the more muscular you are, the stronger you are the better you are able to correct if you start to lose balance or to, you know, again, some of this is just learning gross motor skills and practice, 
but better able to protect yourself if you do have a fall or if there is an imminent collision. The stronger right. you are, the better condition you're in. Generally, the harder you are to hurt. So, yeah. I, again, there's really, there's, there's no, there's, there's no downside to it. Yeah. It, it, yeah. So, I mean, we keep coming back to that, you know, that there, there isn't a downside. It takes a, a little bit of effort. That's, that might be the only, but there's a cost for everything. If you want something, you, you're going to have to pay something, time, effort, money. In this case, a little bit of time and effort, but that's really it. So as, as we, as we kind of, uh, you know, come toward the end of this, and this has been a, extremely informative and helpful, um, some parents uh, have have said to me, my, my, you know, how do I get protein in my, my kid's diet? Because, for example, in schools, um, some schools have either peanut allergy aware or peanut allergy bans. So then that's one source of protein that's gone. So kids can't bring that in. Um, but I do have parents, I have friends, and, and they've said, you know, how do I, what are some protein um, things? Um, you know, they're like, okay, tuna fish, maybe, you know, but this is stuff they're getting off the internet, right? So they're like tuna fish, um, peanuts, but, you know, for, for, you know, people listening right now, parents listening and they're thinking, okay, next time I go shopping and I, I've got my kids along with me, here's three things I never thought about that actually, you know, are protein dense, uh, you know, versus the, you know, snack crackers and the Fruit Loops and you know the, whatever the the other the Doritos or whatever the other thing is. Now, assuming that they're taking their lunch with them or that they're eating lunch at home or whatever, um, chicken, steak, tuna are the easiest things to prepare. In fact, Sunday, you just you make a whole bunch of steak, you make a whole bunch of chicken, you portion it out. Tupperware with whatever vegetables or whatnot that they're going to take with them for the week. And you just label it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. And they've got it. They're ready to go in the morning. Okay, this is Monday's lunch. Put it in there. You know, they can maybe heat it up before they go so it's not you know cold when they're eating it. But steak, chicken, tuna. You can take tuna and make tuna... You don't need to mix a bunch of mayo and stuff. If you can look online, there are some really good recipes for tuna salad that can be made with mustard so that it actually, it's because, it's, man, if you're eating can after can after can of tuna, just plain, you will hate it after a while. <laughs> okay. But, but if you find some recipes, but that's the easiest thing to do. If, the, the highest I would be careful about like ground meats and things like that uh, going in unless it's cooked fresh right before that. But if you get a good steak, steak, chicken, and tuna. How about so, eggs? With lunch. How about, like hard boiled eggs. Eggs. eggs uh, sitting in a lunchbox. Unless you've got a really well insulated lunchbox. I don't know about it later during the day. But your kids should be eating eggs and ham or chicken or other eggs or steak for breakfast instead of bowls of cereal. It doesn't take that much longer to cook. Get a big mixing bowl, you know, put about a dozen eggs or so in there, a little bit of water, mix it up, you know, well, depending on how many kids you're cooking for, but, and then just scramble that in a big pot, high heat, mix it up, move it, or, you know, wait until it can do a little, move it, mix it up, put it back on until, it, you know, there's, there's, there's a best way to make scrambled eggs. I'm not going to get into it too much here, but, but you can make a whole bunch of it at once. Put a little bit of pepper in there, maybe you know, chop up some ham and throw it in there. Sprinkle in some uh, mozzarella or a little bit of cheddar. You can make it in a few minutes. Do you have to put a little time and effort into it? Yes, but would you rather do that and have your kids be relatively strong and lean, or have them eating pop tarts and bagels and donuts and Fruit Loops and whatever for breakfast, and being weak and fat? It, uh, again, there's a cost. There is a cost. Time and effort. Um, not so much a financial cost. A lot of people think, oh, it's going to be too expensive to eat healthy. It really isn't. You just have to plan it. In fact, you save a bunch of money. One thing that I tell clients, because we talk about the planning for, for grocery shopping, is your goals determine your diet. 
Your diet determines your meals. Your meals determine your grocery list. What am I trying to accomplish? What do I have to eat to do that? Okay, I've got to eat this. Let's plan meals based on that. These are my meals. This is what I need to get when I go to the grocery store. If you do that, you come home with the stuff you're going to eat right. and not a bunch of things that end up getting thrown away uh, or that you thought looked good at the time, but eh, and you're not going to eat it. Um, and again, people, oh, you know, meat costs. No, if you watch for the sales, like cuts of steak, chicken, things like that, not the ground stuff, but just meat, whole, will keep in the freezer for at least a year. If it's right. ground, three, four months. But if it's not ground, about a year. You watch for the sales. You get yourself a vacuum sealer. And anytime there's a really good sale on good quality meat you want, get a bunch of it, seal it, put it in the freezer. And you can actually get a lot of really good quality meat without spending a whole ton of money doing it if you do it that way. And you know, some people get bored eating the same thing day in and day out. There's a ton of recipes. If you go online, you know, steak, chicken, there's no ex – the only excuse for people to say, oh, I'm bored with this, is not bothering to do a little bit of homework on different ways to prepare it. But in it, if I had to summarize it in a nutshell, people should eat a lot of meat, fish, eggs, and fibrous vegetables. Moderate amounts of starchy vegetables, fruits, and nuts. And then be a little bit more conservative with adding fats and healthier fats. Butter, lard, beef tallow, uh, coconut oil, things like that. A lot of people think butter, lard, that's, no, that's actually, it, it's healthy as long as you're not eating massive amounts of it. And again, the things that you want to try to be more conservative with are the things that are, you don't have to cut them out entirely. It's not going to, you're not going to die if you have oatmeal once in a while or if you have pancakes occasionally or whatever. But sugar, refined flours, uh, anything with a lot of processed seed and vegetable oils, those are the kind of things that you'd want to minimize. If it's sure. high in calories and it doesn't fill you up and it's poor in other nutrients, you don't want to make it a big part. Again, you don't have to eliminate everything. You just don't want to make it a big part of your diet. So with the groceries, it's not going off on a little tangent here. It's not that expensive if you plan and you don't buy a bunch of garbage that you're not going to eat or you're going to end up throwing away. Just know what you're giving your kids every day, in yourself every day. Buy that. Again, take advantage of the sales for meat. Freeze it. Check before you shop. Do I have something that I could use this week? Okay, we'll pull this out. It just takes some, again, there's, there's a cost for everything. In this case, it's the time that goes into planning. Right. If you invest a little bit of time in planning, you'll save a lot of money in grocery shopping. How about, um, you know, just drinking water? Because, uh, you know, going, to, going down the grocery shopping aisle and people pass you and then they, they configure those, you know, eight packs of soda over the sides of the rails on both sides. And, and um, you know, just, just um, you know, how, how about people should you drink, know, drinking water? It doesn't necessarily have to be water, but calorie free drinks. You don't want to drink your calories if you can avoid it. There's an exception to that. I'll get, I'll get to it though. But most people would do better drinking more, you know, a little bit of coffee and tea in the morning, but more water throughout the day and not, you know, loading up on sugary drinks at uh, Starbucks. And if you get coffee, just get coffee. Maybe put a little bit of creamer in it if you want, right. but you don't need to have a, you know, grande basically with an three days worth of sugar in it. Yeah, that's And I, I remember talking with a trainer years back and uh, they had a client that swore that they were following the diet that they gave them, but they still weren't losing fat. And when they sat down and finally went over exactly what they were eating and drinking on a daily basis, they found out that this person was drinking these Snapple teas all oh. day long. And yeah. they didn't realize that they were full of sugar. They thought that there was no calories in them. And uh, yeah, people have no idea how much they're drinking. Now, the only, and this is the only time that I okay. would recommend people drink their calories is people who are underweight, who are having difficulty putting on 
a lot of muscle because there are some there's two problems you don't want to be over fat but you also don't want to be under muscled ideally you want to have a not everybody has to be massively muscular but you want to have a good amount of muscle on your frame muscle is your body's motors the more muscle you have the more you can do also a lot of people don't realize the health of your circulatory system depends largely on your muscle mass. Your, I don't want to go off on, on too much of a tangent with that, but your muscles assist with circulation. Whenever right. you move, you're contracting your muscles. They exert pressure on the veins, and it helps drive venous blood back towards the heart. Your heart. People are taught in school your heart is the pump that moves the blood around your body. It doesn't do it alone. Your heart is aided by your muscles, and it's aided by the pressure change in your abdomen versus your uh, thoracic cavity by respiration. The muscular pump and the respiratory pump help your heart to move that blood around. The stronger your muscles are, and especially in the legs, the, the calves, Right. The better your circulation. You can't have, well, I shouldn't say you can't have too much muscle. It's almost impossible for any genetically average, drug-free person to have too much muscle. Uh, but some people don't have nearly as much as they would like. And when you're eating a lot of protein and you're not eating a lot of garbage that doesn't fill you up and is just full of calories, sometimes it can be difficult if you're trying to eat healthy, it's very difficult to overeat. I've actually had clients complain to me, not because they're hungry, but because how am I supposed to finish this? Uh, you know, right. just eat half a pound of chicken and a huge bowl of you know, spinach, cucumber, tomato, other things chopped up in it. Not a lot of calories, but it will it will you'll feel stuffed after that. You could. You could easily eat twice as many calories if it was a big bowl of rice with just a little bit of meat, though. But some people have difficulty, and in that case, I'll tell them it's easier to drink the calories. But for most people, it's a recipe for getting fat because of how easy it is. So there, if you are underweight and you are trying to increase muscle mass, then, yeah, drink your calories if it helps you to get enough that you are putting on muscle not so much that you start getting fat. You start getting fat, and then you want to cut back. But if you're having difficulty losing fat, if you are fatter than you ought to be, then you should not be getting, you don't have to cut out. You know, you can have a little milk once in a while, but you shouldn't be right. down in orange juice and sodas and what was it, frappuccinos and whatever else they load full of sugar at Starbucks. Right. Yeah, I and of course, you know, the energy drinks, you know, <laughs> everywhere you go, the, 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 the big, yeah. you know, most people crack don't it open get and drinks. they need more sleep. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, in closing, how about, um, you know, a, a parent says, okay, listen to this. Um, it's resonating with me. I want to do something, but you know, we live in an apartment, like, um, what, what can I reasonably do for fitness or my kids like push-ups or like you know pushing against the wall or because i'm not gonna be you know i might be moving i don't want to invest in anything if you live and in a, i don't have a budget how do how do you respond to that a chin-up bar that can go in a doorway portable chin-up bar can be put in a doorway and pulled right out of the doorway you don't have to affix anything to it you don't have to modify the structure and a suspension trainer uh, you know, let me let me grab something really quick and show you this. Okay. These typically come in pairs. We've got a handle on one end, and it's a strap, and this is adjustable. Okay. And there's a loop at the top with a hook that just goes through here, so that can go over a chin-up bar. So you get this with the handle. It's adjustable. You gotcha. get a set of those, and you get a chin-up bar that just goes in the doorway. That barely takes up any space. The chin-up bar barely takes up any space. And you have your kids do squats with body weight, chin-ups, and that's if they can't do chin-ups. Adjust the handles so it's at shoulder height when they're standing. They lower themselves and lift themselves with their arms while assisting with their legs. Okay. They give themselves just enough assistance with their legs that they can complete maybe 10 good slow reps. Then push-ups. Squats, chin-ups, and push-ups work 
almost all the big muscle groups in the hips and thighs and torso. If they want, they can alternate the chin-ups with a row. You set the handles at about hip height, and with your body straight, you're pulling up. Oh, and yeah, gotcha. Them. It's it's like it's basically it's an upside down push up. Instead of pressing yourself okay. up off the ground and lowering yourself, you're laying on your back, you get the handles, you pull up, and then you let yourself down. As soon as your back touches the ground without setting yourself down, you do the next one. Crunches or a plank for the abdominal muscles, and then you can do a hip raise off the ground or with your shoulders on the couch. With the glutes, the hamstrings, low back if you want to rest, or you could prone back extension. And then for the calves, stand holding a door frame for balance. Come up on your heels as high as you, or up, raise your heels coming up off the balls of your feet as high as you can go. And then a couple things most people don't focus on, but it's important. The neck, I mentioned earlier, take your fingers, you interlace them, put them on the back of your head, and you press back against it. Take okay. the heels of your palm, put them against your not under, but it needs to be above the eyebrows. Your this, this skin is thin. Give yourself black eyes. Okay. But on the forehead, just above the eyebrows, push forward. You do it for 90 seconds. 30 seconds, moderately hard. 30 seconds, pretty hard. Not as hard as you can, but close. And then as hard as you feel you can safely contract for the last 30 seconds. And then, finally, you just hang on to the chin-up bar squeezing it for as long as you can. So between gotcha. the squat, the chin-up, or the row, and the push-ups, get all the big muscles in the torso and the hips and thighs. The crunch in the back extension with the hip raise, you get your abdominal muscles, low back, you get a little bit more work for the glutes and hamstrings. The heel raise, you've got your calves. The neck, you've got your neck. And then the two-arm hang, you've got the, well, the grip muscles, not necessarily the forearm. This is pretty basic. And you can complete this in under 20 minutes without even rushing between the exercises in the space of a doorway. You don't need to have – now, there's – if you've got barbells, if you've got dumbbells, you can do a lot more. If you've got a gym membership, you can do a lot more. In the long run, though, and this is important because people – again, for, for a lot of people – They'll invent excuses to not do it. Oh, I can't afford a gym membership. I don't have time to go over here and stop here. We don't have room in our apartment or our house for uh, gym or all this stuff. There's, in the long run, how you do the exercises is far more important in terms of the increases in strength and general fitness than the specific equipment you use. If you do this stuff correctly, you can get stronger and fitter using your own body weight, using barbells and dumbbells, using machines. It's how you use it that is the most important. So you can very effectively, you can very safely and efficiently train at home without having to spend. Everybody, Drew Bay on the Safety Doc Podcast. A shout out here to my other camera that's filming me from the Safety uh, Doc Studio down at the North Star. We're up to about 53 degrees here, Drew, so... You know, who knows where we're going to end up at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, but more than that. <laughs> yeah, this is my insulated thermal sport coat uh, for today's show. So brought to you by uh, Oscar De La Renta. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for being a, a guest on the show, Drew. Thanks for having me on. It was my pleasure. A lot of fun. This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perotti. Remember to check back each week for the latest, best, and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perotti on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.